So when I was um, asked to come along here today, I was asked to share my, my big idea with you. But um, I didn't really have a big idea. I had to kind of think about it. And I thought, I suppose I do. Um, but I just go to work every day and I fight the good fight and I try and work this job and, and, and do this thing that started. And it started actually 13 years ago when my best friend, um, Robbie Irving, We'd been friends and colleagues, and we were in school together and grew up together, and everyone was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, MS. And as a chap with MS, he was quite likely to need to use a wheelchair at some time in his future. And we thought we knew something about using a wheelchair. Our mothers both used wheelchairs, his from having MS and mine from having had a stroke. And we don't know how to fix MS. We're not doctors, we're engineers. And we said, let's build you a set of robot legs because that's what you do when you're a boy and an engineer. And he's a really good engineer, and he said, what about batteries? And I said, well, you'd need two, wouldn't you? You'd need one if it, one ran out, you'd need another one. And we started this conversation, and the conversation went on for six months, just talking about it. We were both overseas at the time we moved back to New Zealand. We're very passionate about living in New Zealand. It's a wonderful, wonderful country, and it's a wonderful place to, to develop technology as well. And um, yeah, we thought we knew something about these, these access and attitudinal barriers that people faced. I didn't like the way that my mother was treated after she had a stroke. People treated her differently. She was my mum. She was a big, strong farm girl. She was a real character, you know? She's passed now, but she was a real character, this woman. And suddenly people started treating her differently. They were saying, does she want a cup of tea? Um, I could ask her. She's just sitting. She's not a child. She's not stupid. She's not sick. She uses a wheelchair to get around, it's, you know, instead of her legs. And then they would, she would buy something in a shop if she could get into the shop and people would hand me their change. I'm not a keeper of her money, you know. But this was the way that she started to be treated. And somehow or another, it was always the access to the building was always round the back through the goods lift and up the stairs. There was always stairs and stairs were really the enemy of a wheelchair in so many ways. And I didn't like that either. My mother's been passed in through the goods goods entrance. So we decided we would build a set of robot legs um, that would allow Robbie to get, carry on his work as an engineer and stand at his workbench and all the rest of it. And we actually worked away in secret for four years. We um, didn't tell anybody about what we were doing because we didn't want to set expectations we couldn't meet. We didn't want funders who wanted progress that we didn't know if we were going to be able to do. And we didn't want to set expectations with um, users either. So we started secretly, which is kind of an unusual way to develop a product like this. But, but over the years, we actually did start to talk to more and more people um, as, as time went on. And we kind of found that this, this was actually a really big problem. This is a problem that was affecting many millions of people around the world every day. You know, there's lots of numbers around, but maybe five million people use a wheelchair to get around every day. And that's people with spinal cord injuries and muscular dystrophy and multiple sclerosis and cerebral palsy and all these other things. There's, there's lots of it. And you might even say that all of us at some time or another will spend some time with some kind of mobility impairment, some kind of disability. And it's something that affects all of us, even if it's at the end of our lives, even if it's a relation or whatever. And so this was a really huge problem that was coming up. Now, it has high costs. I mean, it has high societal costs, high costs to the individuals, but there's high costs to healthcare, and, th and these things have to be paid for. If you look at strokes every year in the world, there's 15 million people have a stroke. About 10 million will survive, and about 80% of them will be, have a, an upper limb disability, and about half of them will be left with a permanent disability. And in the US, that's 800,000 people a year and that costs 34 billion US dollars a year to take care of that. So this was a, a huge number of people that we were talking about. And it, we actually started to feel a real pressure, a real pull to, to develop this business and to, to, to develop this thing that we were doing because it, it was becoming really quite serious, actually, from this conversation. But it wasn't all about walking and mobility as we first thought it was. I mean, walking is really useful. If you think about what you've done in the last 24 hours and imagine doing that in a wheelchair, it might be a very different experience. Um, but it was actually more, people were coming to us more and more and more from secondary complications of using a wheelchair. People were coming to us because, and different for different conditions, but bowel and bladder issues, contractures, deformities of the spine, spasms, pressure areas, all these things that happen when you don't walk. And we know walking's good for us. We all know that intuitively. It is borne out by a large body of medical evidence, but we do know intuitively that walking is good for us. In fact, they say now that sitting is the new smoking. 
So what did we do? In the end, we actually we built this robotic exoskeleton Rex you can see here. But on the screen, you'll see a video. And on the video, you'll see Sophie, who's one of our ambassadors. This is in her home in London. Um, she uses a Rex regularly. She has a high-level thoracic spinal cord injury, so from the chest down. She has no sensation, no movement, no control over that. And she can get herself into the machine and she can walk around in her flat and use it on a regular basis. And she does that a lot of the times just to do the activities of daily living, cook and clean and do the dishes and all those things. But at the same time, she's getting the benefits of that standing and walking and that weight bearing, gravity acting on your body naturally, movement acting on your body naturally. Those things that we know that are so important. And you can see her there controlling the device through a joystick because she has no sensation from there down. We, didn't have any other way of running the machine that can't pick up her intention to move like that. You can see her walking and she can move forward, she can move backwards, she can go sideways, she can turn. And in that device, she can go up and down stairs and up and down slopes. And these are really important things. They say that if you can stand for an hour a day, you will avoid an awful lot of these health issues. That's all it really takes. It's not really meant for going up Mount Everest or anything like that. It's meant to do you know, a few stairs and to get people outside and into places typical to here. And what do people use Rex for? Well, they use it for all sorts of things. Actually, we built Rex as a tool. So what we have is we have the only self-supporting exoskeleton in the world. And why that's important is that it means that most, lots and lots of people can get in it. More people can get in this exoskeleton than any other type in the world, and it's more supportive, and they can get in with higher level injuries than get in with strokes, they can get in with muscular scler multiple sclerosis muscular dystrophy or spinal cord injuries or in fact any impairment. The device doesn't really differentiate between them. And so you see people on the slide doing their activities of daily living. You see people doing physiotherapy in the machine. You'll see them going out to social occasions. And in the middle of the slide that's on the screen just now, you'll see a guy standing and giving his daughter away at her wedding and he would normally use a wheelchair. And this is the beautiful thing about Rex is it, it's a a real workhorse, it's been called now, particularly in America, they love, that, they love that saying. And it's very simple to drive and use. You press forward and the thing walks forward, you press backwards and it walks backwards. And you get a fantastic stretch when you're stepping backwards in this thing, it stretches your hip flexors out, a movement that you wouldn't do in a wheelchair. And it's actually quite the opposite of sitting all the time. And it can turn. Watch this, it's very Michael Jackson. There we go. <laughs> That's the nearest I get to being good at dancing. We sell dancing functions as an optional extra, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and get home from the pub for those that are going to go in that direction. And that's it. It's really incredibly simple. So we've built the exoskeleton. It works really well. And it's been used in, in rehabilitation centers around the world. People use them at home and, you know, fantastic bit of kit. So what next? Well, this is where I think it gets really cool for the geeks, especially the nerds like myself. You know, science fiction becoming science fact, I talk about it. So on the screen, you'll see a picture of a guy who's using an electric wheelchair. He has a C3 spinal cord injury, so a very high neck level injury. In fact, he can't even breathe on his own. He uses a ventilator to breathe or to assist him in breathing. And this is a picture, the picture on the right of him, when he went down to a conference we were doing in Spain, and you can see him thought controlling the robot. So this is a guy who can't breathe for himself, but he can think, walk, and he can walk when he's in one of these machines. And people will say to me, how, how, how accessible is this? Where, where's the stage of this technology? It seems just too incredible. In actual fact, it's here. I mean, this is a very scientific um, conference, and so he's wearing quite a complex set of equipment there. But you know, you, today you can go out, buy an EEG cap for about $500, link it up to your Rex, and think, walk, and walk. So it's pretty amazing stuff. But the really exciting thing about that, and what do you do after you've built a robotic exoskeleton company? Well, taking that link of intention to move and linking it with movement, we know gets a greater rehabilitation effect. If you can link that intention, you get people to rehabilitate better, to improve better. So it kind of leads me on to my next exciting part of the journey, or my next big idea, I suppose. And we formed a company called Exergio. Exergio rehab, and exergio means to stand, to rise, to rehabilitate, to recover. And what we've done is we've pulled together a team of rehabilitation specialists, and we're coming back around to the start of the story to stroke, because so many people are having a stroke. As I said earlier, there's 15 million people a year having a stroke with this huge societal cost, this huge financial cost. 
but just this very human thing that sometime or another will touch all of us somewhere in our families or even in ourselves. And so Exergo has been developed, really, to bring together this team of specialists. And why? Well, in conventional rehabilitation, an awful lot about, of recovery is about time on task. The more time you spend doing these tasks and the more time you spend doing recovery, the more recovery you're going to get. This is a great generalization, but roughly speaking, that's it. And we have these amazing clinicians, these physiotherapists and occupational therapists and all these wonderful people out there who work in this system. And they're well trained, they, they spend a long time in uni, they learn all these things, they're very intuitive about the body and they work away every day one-on-one -on -one with these 15 million people and all the other things that are happening as well. And it's a one-on-one -on -one process. And most of what these incredibly skilled and talented people do is very simple, boring, repetitive tasks. That's where we come in. Boring, simple, repetitive tasks lend themselves really, really well to being done by pieces of machinery. So what we want to do is help the rehabilitation specialist to recover some of their time. A kind of combination of the man and the machine. We don't want to replace them completely because nothing can replace the skills and the, and the touch and that human interaction that they have with their um, patients. And that's a big part of the process. But the ability for machines to take over some of that movement is quite fantastic. In fact, in our earliest trials that we've had in this space, we're actually seeing up to three times faster recoveries from stroke. Now, that's within somebody's limit of recovery. And we're actually seeing them keeping that recovery longer because we're not just stretching and maneuvering and moving these muscles. We're actually rerouting the brain. So it's not just a movement, but it's actual movement therapy where what we're doing is we're linking somebody's intention to move with their movement and we get enough repetitions in and we're actually managing to reroute and rewire some of the, around some of the damaged parts of the brain. It's called neuroplasticity. And if you can do that, you're not just giving somebody a stretch and fixing that, that particular issue. You're actually giving them the ability to continue to rehabilitate moving forward. And that's what the connected nature of these machines does as well. People can take these machines home with them and still be connected to their physio. The physio can still monitor their activity. And there's so much work that these specialists do that's paperwork and billing and all these other boring things that you have to do to keep the system going. In fact, when I was doing this, I, I spoke to a physiotherapist and I said to the physio, how many patients do you see a day? 12. Okay. How long's a session? An hour. How many hours do you work? Eight. Well, that doesn't work, I know. That's why I'm late home every night. And then when do you do the billing bit, the fill out the paperwork? I do that after I do all the patients. And I try and remember what I did 12 hours before and I scribble it down and we send it away and we get our billing in. That's what these highly skilled people are doing. And this is a growing problem. I mean, 10 million people a year surviving from the strokes and they're living longer than they used to. We have a growing problem here and we have to do something to address it or we won't get the recovery that, that people need and deserve and, and that it costs. So keeping these machines connected actually means that we'll be able to continue that journey for even longer. So back to the original question, my idea, my big idea is to build a robot army. But don't worry, we're not taking over the world <laughs> yet. <laughs> Trust me. Um, no, actually what we're doing is we're building a robot army of rehabilitation devices that can free up these clinicians' time, that can give people more recovery than what they can get now, and to really change the face of rehabilitation. And we're very, very proud to say that we do this in New Zealand, and we do it really close to here in Auckland, just over on the North Shore. And almost everything is designed and made within a 10-kilometre circle. So it's a fantastic effort from some very proud Kiwis and a couple of Scots as well to change the face of rehabilitation. Thank you very much.